Welcome to A New York Christmas to Remember at St. Paul the Apostle, featuring Regis Philbin and the puppetry of Jane Henson. Music by the St. Paul the Apostle Choir and Orchestra, the National Children's Chorus, and the Fordham University Choir. Christmas to remember from the Church of St. Paul the Apostle. Across time and distance, in royal David's city, Bethlehem was the littlest among the towns of Judea, and in her the Prince of Peace was born. God always remembers the little ones. We too must become little. Today, the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem has only one entrance door, and you cannot pass through it without bending down. 
the doors set low to remind pilgrims that in order to penetrate the deep meaning of Christmas, it is necessary to humble oneself and become little. So at Christmas, we remember the little Lord Jesus, asleep in the hay, as the carol says. We remember that Christmas celebrates the love of God, a love that is not limited to Bethlehem. To celebrate Christmas is to remember that you are embraced by a love special to you, saying you are loved no matter what, and that there is a unique love in you that the world itself needs from you. This love invites you to make room for others in your life and to make special room for the poor and to make room for generosity in your heart so that you will always desire to do good and be good for others, for true and lasting joy come from sharing the love inside of you. This is how the little Christmas story comes alive again today. And now please give a warm welcome to our good friend Regis Philbin, who will read this Christmas story, Come Alive Through the Puppetry of Jane Henson. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we begin, uh, I just wanted to tell you uh, how happy I am to be able to do this uh, tonight. Um, and you know, I, I, uh, my mother was born on 59th Street, and this was her church. And all through her life, uh, even though we moved away, uh, she would say to me, those Polish priests were the best were the best that we've ever met. And uh, she loved them all very, very much. Just for your information, I was baptized in that fount back there, right? Couldn't get in it tonight, but I took a good long look at it. Anyway, I'm really happy to be here. It's gonna be a wonderful show that we have for you all. And we'll get started right now with the Annunciation. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming to her, he said, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at what was said and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father, and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. But Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I have no relations with a man? And the angel said to her in reply, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, your relative has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her, who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible for God. Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaiden of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. 
Then the angel departed from her. The story and legacy of Mary is often seen as something far off, intangible, as unlikely as a Hail Mary pass at the end of a football game. But Mary's yes to God's call is alive. It lives on even today. Mary was taken by surprise, unsure, maybe even quietly excited. But that moment, those emotions, they really happened to a woman who may have never dreamed of what God had in store for her. This story isn't just for Christmas pageants and religious services. It is meant to be lived in our everyday. 
Mary's yes is a call to action for us on this Christmas Eve. We may at times feel alone, afraid as Mary did, but God is reaching out to us even in the most unexpected moments, in the face of uncertainties and doubts. God is asking us to say yes amid all the noise we encounter. I try to open myself up to accept this in my own life, at home with family for the holidays, as I walk through the doors of my parish, in my work and education, in conversation with friends. I look at these calls to vocation, to relationship, to service, and I'll be honest, I often feel overwhelmed, challenged, uncertain, but I'm trying to exemplify the faith and trust that Mary showed us, to listen to God's call and respond not with fear, but with love. Her yes is one of the most powerful acts of love that continues to inspire even today. It excites me as I imagine where God will lead me. Our vision of how our life will play out may not be the exact course that God has mapped out for us, but Mary's example shows us how to respond even when God redirects our life, how to accept his love and share it with those around us, how to trust his plan despite not knowing what lies ahead. Do we have the courage to embrace God's call? Yes, God, I'm in, I'm ready. May it be done unto me according to your word.
the visitation. During those days, Mary set out and traveled to the hill country in haste to a town of Judah, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the infant leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, cried out in a loud voice and said, Most blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how does this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For at the moment, the sound of your greeting reached my ears. The infant in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed are you who believed that what was spoken to you by the Lord would be fulfilled.
Reflecting on the visitation, there were three things that struck me. First, Mary went in haste to visit her cousin Elizabeth. Mary has just been blessed by the Holy Spirit and is carrying the Christ child. Yet she leaves the comfort of her home in a hurry to care for Elizabeth. They lived in different towns, so it must have been a difficult trip traveling on foot. Yet she showed such determination and dedication to be there for Elizabeth. Second, these two pregnant women, holy women, both blessed by the Holy Spirit, coming together in joy and expectation. Mary, young and newly pregnant, Elizabeth, older and thought to be barren. Imagine their feelings. The joy in their greeting is palpable. Even the child John in his mother's womb leaped for joy. They were believers. They knew that Mary was carrying the Christ child sent by the Lord. They had faith. They did not question. The third thing, what does all of this mean for me or you? How can I follow Mary's example and go in haste to love and serve the Lord? Who is Elizabeth for me? And how can I be there for others? Be they friend, neighbor, relative, or even a stranger? Will I have the faith that Mary and Elizabeth had and trust in the Lord? The Church of St. Paul the Apostle was established in 1858 by the new religious community of Roman Catholic priests, the Paulist Fathers, founded by Father Isaac Thomas Hecker, who is now being considered for sainthood. In his youth, Isaac Hecker was a searcher, much like young adults today who are searching for how their lives are part of something greater. Drawn by a mystical experience and the depth of Catholic tradition, young Isaac Hecker would join the church and then be ordained a priest. After founding the Paulist Fathers, Father Hecker wanted to build a church that reflected America. So St. Paul the Apostle, the Paulist Mother Church, was decorated by some of the greatest American artists of the 19th century. Today, the Paulist Fathers continue Father Hecker's vision of being missionaries to North America, sharing the good news of God's love and compassion in downtown parishes, on college campuses, and through all forms of modern media. Anywhere you find the intersection of faith and culture, you will likely find a Paulist. Through Paulist Press books, Paulist Productions films and television programs, and the Busted Halo website and radio show, Paulists reach out to people in all walks of life. In New York, St. Paul's is a gathering place for everyone. Programs engage young adults, gay and lesbian Catholics, artists, returning Catholics, and seekers. Through its soup kitchen and winter shelter, parishioners serve hundreds of their neighbors in need. The church welcomes students from neighboring schools, including Fordham University, the Juilliard School, and the John Jay College of Criminal Justice. The Church of St. Paul the Apostle is a designated New York City landmark and is located just a block from Columbus Circle and the main entrance to Central Park and next door to Lincoln Center. Visit us on your next trip to the Big Apple. The Nativity. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole world should be enrolled. This was the first enrollment when Quirinius was governor of Syria. So all went to be enrolled, each to his own town. And Joseph too went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, that is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David to be enrolled with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. While they were there, the time came for her to have her child. 
and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were shepherds in that region, living in the fields and keeping the night watch over their flock. The angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were struck with great fear. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, a Savior has been born for you, who is Messiah and Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find an infant wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels went away from them to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go then to Bethlehem to see this thing that has taken place which the Lord has made known to us. So they went in haste and found Mary and Joseph and the infant lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known the message that had been told them about this child. All who heard it were amazed by what had been told them by the shepherds. And Mary kept all these things, reflecting on them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, just as it had been told to them.
Leave it to our loving God to bring life when and where we least expect it. Neither in antiquity nor perhaps today is this the circumstance we expect to surround the birth of a person of prominence, much less the savior of the world. Jesus shares in our humanity and in his life begins in a place we least expect it, a virgin's womb. But today, we are all privy to the fate of this newborn who once again is given life in the most unlikely of places, this time a tomb on Calvary. The incarnation is not limited to one night in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, for God continues to enter our world and our lives every day. Throughout my life's journey, there have been countless difficulties and challenges. Yet, in each challenge, I experienced in a special way the peace, comfort, and presence of God. Looking back on my years of Jesuit education, I remember the call to seek and find God in all things. This was never more challenging or real than in my mom's recent battle with cancer. As you would likely expect, it was a time of fear, anxiety, and trepidation. But it was also a time of love, compassion, and joy. So much love was poured out to my mom and our entire family. In the midst of fear, there was comfort. In the midst of chaos, peace. And in the midst of the threat of death, there was life. Leave it to our loving God to bring life when and where we least expect it. For any night and time in which God brings life, continue to be a holy night, a night divine. The custom of displaying manger scenes of the birth of Christ owes its origin to St. Francis of Assisi. It was he who created the first nativity scene in the year 1223, saying, I want to enact the memory of the infant Jesus, who was deprived of all the comforts babies enjoy, bedded in a manger on hay between an ox and a donkey. For once, I want to see all this with my own eyes. For St. Francis, who left behind worldly riches for a life of poverty, the manger scene was a reminder of how God humbled himself descending from the heavens to be born in a stable. The current Pope was so inspired by the humble example of St. Francis that he took on his name. Pope Francis has called this saint the man of the poor, the man of peace, the man who loved and cared for creation. Thanks to St. Francis of Assisi, people are still able to see the story of Christmas come alive today through a great variety of nativity scenes. And what better time of year than Christmas to pray that famous prayer of St. Francis, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace.
the three kings. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of King Herod, behold, Magi from the east arrived to Jerusalem, saying, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star at its rising, and have come to do him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was greatly troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired where the Messiah was to be born. He said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it has been written through the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, since from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and ascertained from them the time of the star's appearance. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the child. When you have found him, bring me word that I too may go and do him homage. After their audience with the king, they set out. And behold, the star that they had seen at its rising preceded them until it came and stopped over the place where the child was. They were overjoyed at seeing the star, and on entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother. They prostrated themselves and did him homage. Then they opened their treasures and offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And after having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for their country by another way.
I think it's safe to say that everyone here has gotten into an argument. And probably when we were in the thick of it, we were convinced of one thing. The other guy was wrong. Now maybe you settled the argument, and maybe you didn't, and maybe 20 years later you're still convinced that he was wrong. And that feeling is terrific! Because knowing that somebody else is wrong can give us purpose. I may not know who I am, but I'm sure not him. Which is why it's hard for us to imagine life without the need for someone else to be wrong. Now, we usually don't put Herod and the Magi together, but they have some things in common. Both came from a world where a great king was admired for his ability to crush enemies and dispatch rivals. The Magi go looking for a new king. Though the star that leads them isn't shining there, they go to the logical place to find a king, a palace. Then something happens. They meet a king, but a king unlike any other. A king in whom there is no rivalry, no enemies at all. The Magi are changed. They hand their lives over to the king and return by another route, putting distance between themselves and their old world, a world that cannot imagine life without the need for someone to be wrong. There will always be arguments, but next time, Trust that a king, unlike any other, has your back. Decide you don't have to be right, even if you are, and watch a miracle happen. My mom was a sculptress and a ceramicist and a painter, and her own personal artwork was very important to her. When she did her own artwork, very often she used themes from the scripture. As a child, we had these crush pieces that she had made around the house, and I, they were some of my favorite pieces of artwork of hers. I got a phone call about midnight one night from Heather Henson, Jane's youngest daughter, who called and said, my mom would really like to talk to you about this nativity show she wants to do. The high concept when we got together here at the carriage house was that we would have a nativity show where a nativity scene, a manger scene for Christmas, came to life. This is a very personal production uh, created by someone who had a very deep connection to the Christmas story. It is a small puppet show. It's not very long, but, but it really took a lot of hands and a lot of minds and a lot of hearts to, to get here to this place to perform it at the church. This particular production is, is important because it harkens back to a time when puppetry was used in the church, particularly through uh, the telling of the nativity story. So in some ways, um, we are sort of returning to that old form, and that kind of keeps it vital. I think one thing that she loved about this production is that it's a celebration of giving birth. That is the birth of Jesus. It is the celebration of the miracle of all birth. And to her, having had five children, that miracle really touched her heart to his home that is so important to her. Now I think she would love to have this performed in a church and I don't think she ever imagined that would ever ever happen. She loved the idea of the piece and she had told me probably three years ago it was on her bucket list of things to do. She wanted to see this piece done. Thank you for joining us for a New York Christmas to remember in the Church of St. Paul the Apostle. We've enjoyed our time with you on this very holy night. May the God of infinite goodness, who sent his angels to shepherds to announce the great joy of Christmas, fill you with joy and peace. May the God of light scatter the darkness and brighten your hearts with holiness. And may Almighty God give you his peace and goodwill. And may the joy of the Christmas message of love find room in your heart always. Merry Christmas.